All right, we're still in chapter 10. I deal with a few verses from chapter 10 this morning. I'll read verses 8 through 13. So turn to chapter 10 of the book of Romans this morning. Chapter 10, verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame, for there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. <coughs> Father, we ask that we, you add your presence and your power to this, the proclamation of your holy word. Amen. So verse 9, one of the great gospel verses of all time, the great summary. There's so much, so much packed into this one little verse, and we will go into it all this morning and draw out and glean those gems of truth from this verse. And so Paul writes, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Thou shalt be saved. Now, if any of you dozed off while I was reading that verse, and you just happened to wake up when I said, thou shalt be saved, you should be prodding the guy next to you saying, asking him, what did he say before that? What must I do to be saved? Like the jailer in Philippi when he said to Silas and Paul, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And he said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. So after all of this doctrinal teaching in this epistle up to this point, ten chapters, it all boils down to this, belief and confession. It's the most amazing theological principle in all of human understanding. It, it never ceases to amaze me that we have a, a story about a man who lived 2,000 years ago, and he came and he taught and he healed and he fed and he did various miracles and he raised people from the dead and he showed people who he was. He was the son of God and he came and he died as a sacrifice for our sin. He went into a grave. He rose again from the dead. And in the hearing of it, God does something to us to let the truth of it enter into us. And it never leaves. It can't be argued away. It's yours. It's yours. It, you grasp onto it and you can never release it. No one can take it from you. And no one can take you from him. And it always amazes me that it's belief in this tale. The gospel is a narrative. It's a story. And it's filled, though, with historical and physical and spiritual truths. And it's the greatest source, in fact, the only source of real truth. And it just always amazes me that when we believe it, it changes us. And it does it in an instance. It's the most amazing theological principle conceivable. To know something, to believe in the heart, it says, and I'm going to work on that a bit today. To believe that the, Lord, the lordship of Christ is unquestionably true, it's a transformative moment in your life. I remember the moment when the Lord came into me and I said, I've heard these things all my life, but today it's different. And it will always be this way. And I knew it. And I told my friends, and they didn't believe me. They said, I won't, it won't stay that way. I said, it will. And I haven't read all of the word yet, but I'm going to read it. And when I read it, I'm going to believe it. And they said, how do you know? And I said, I don't know. 
but I know that the Spirit of God came into me and opened my eyes to it. I know beforehand that when I read God's Word, it's true. You know, we talked on Thursday night about confirmation bias. You see people, they come into the church, and they stay and they fellowship and they hear the Word and they, and they love to be taught and then all of a sudden, they're gone. And you say, where did they go? They heard something that didn't comport with what they already knew. They were looking to hear stuff they already knew. They weren't really looking to be taught anything new. It's like it's why you listen to your news carrier, because he tells you what you want to hear. It's called confirmation bias, and you see it in the church, and it's a weakness, and I try to break us out of it. Now, there's certain things that we don't let anyone steal, but they can't take them anyway. The truth can't be taken away from you, and I'm going to labor over that for the next couple of weeks. But you do need to expand sometimes. You do need to say, you know, that's new. But he taught it from Scripture, and he corroborated it from other Scriptures and other wise commentators on it. It must be something I need to know. Because you're here, and God is in us, and the gifts of the Spirit are here, and my voice is preaching the Word of God this morning, and it's not for nothing. It's for something, and it's for something eternal, and it's for something temporal. Right now, it will benefit you to learn something new this morning. To know something, to believe something new changes us. It changed us at the beginning, and to know new stuff will continue to change us. That's why wise counsel from parents or friends can help people, can help our children and their children. It can change them. To hear something is, can be transformative if you let it happen. The moment it becomes clear, the instant the hearer knows somewhere deep within himself, in the heart, we're told, he's forever changed. He's forever protected from the outcome of the former road he was on. He'll never return to it. He'll never reap the destruction that he was headed for, for before he heard it and believed it. All that's been changed in that one, one wonderful moment of belief. On Thursday evening, we, we talked about it. With belief that is pure and naked, and unadulterated that brings conviction that the Lord Jesus of the gospel narratives is the Lord of heaven and earth, the new believer is converted out of what he was and into a whole new glorious position with God. He heard the name of Jesus. Everyone has. They use him to swear. Everyone knows his name. And suddenly, they hear his name connected with glory. And they realize what sinners they've become. And that happens in a moment. And that moment changes them. If you believe, you will be saved. And you'll be changed from what you were. To the Ephesians, Paul wrote about it. He says, at that time, you were without Christ. I remember those days. At that time when I was without Christ. He said... Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, see, Israel had all the, the blessings sort of compounded upon them. And the outside world didn't know these things, and he's preaching here to the Gentile world, that's us. He said, you were without Christ, you were aliens from Israel, you were strangers from the covenants, you had no hope, and were without God in the world. Because that's what you have when you're in the world, you're without God, you're strangers to truth. He said, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. And so our verse becomes the quintessential gospel verse. It's best approached by looking into the meaning of the several operative words, which I'll go into in some detail, believing certainly. Being saved has to do with confession. To confess is to say something. Believing begets proclaiming. Have you noticed that? Proclaiming is the 
overflow of belief. Proclaiming is the outward declarative part of the inward conviction. When you've come to believe certain things, proclaiming it is just the overflow of it. Proclaiming the word of God is a celebration of the belief. You have the belief that's changed you, right? But proclaiming it is the overflow of it. It's the celebration of it. Confession is the reflex action of ardent inward conviction of a fact that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's an admission of personal recognition of an objective reality. And I want to treat that with some emphasis this morning. Now, some people are troubled by the implication of confession as a work. Did that enter into your mind at all? It said we must confess with our mouth. And so it seems to them that if we confess that we must do something to merit our salvation, and Paul has just spent nine and a half chapters telling us there's nothing we can do. We're justified by God. It's God who does the work. But that's, so that's theologically untenable, isn't it? Paul, as I said, spent the better part up to this point to tell us there's no work, there's no act that a man can perform upon which salvation can be based. So if you were to ask me whether or not confession was necessary to believing, I would say that my simple answer is no. I would say that confession is the character of true faith. You see, true faith has content. You must believe in Christ and him risen from the dead, he said, but it also has character. And the character part of it is it never exists in silence. The word is trying to be preached. It has a life of its own. Believing's all that's required to get you saved. And, but remember, belief's not a human work. It's a gift of God. It just comes to you as a gift. We call it faith. From Ephesians again, Paul makes that very clear. He says, you have been saved through faith, which is not of yourself. It's the gift of God. Faith, believing, is the gift of God. God inserts it into whomever he will. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. No one's going to be in heaven say, saying, Look, the, look at all the good work I did to get here. Thankfully, I did the heavy lifting of believing to get here. No one's going to even think that way. Perhaps you noticed in the, in the reading that the order of events in verse 9 is reversed in verse 10. Let me give it to you. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, it says verse 9, and with verse 10 it says, for with the heart one believes and with the mouth confession is made. Sort of reverse the order, all right? That troubles some people, and there are certainly some people who want us to be troubled by that. Um, so the order of events is, is switched in the two verses, but as usual, the context will clarify the problem. Verse 9, verse 9 are the words of a man speaking about himself as a Christian. And so he refers to, first to confession. And verse 10 is the explanation of how he became able to speak at all with regard to faith. And so faith necessarily precedes confession. You couldn't confess something without believing it. And Paul's not saying that. It's always a difficult thing to parse a theological principle with regard to chronology. In other words, what happens first? Because really, it happens simultaneously. You hear the gospel, right? It enters into you. You believe it, and you say, I believe it. And it really all happens at once. So it's difficult to parse things as though there's an order of events. Um, but the real course of events always begins with an act of God. That's number one. God has to act or there is no belief. There is no saving act upon the soul. God always acts first in salvation. He regenerates. That is, he renews the believer before anything actually happens to him. Do you realize that? 
He regenerates the believer before anything actually happens to it. So in a nanosecond of time, if I can put it that way, you're already saved before you're even able to believe and confess. Regeneration necessarily precedes faith, and I'm going to show you that. From chapter 8, Paul really labored over this relationship, and so we read this. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life. To be carnally minded, fleshly minded, the way you were born, that's death. And we know that. Everyone dies, right? But to be spiritually minded is life. In other words, if God can do something to fundamentally change your ability to think, he can change your eternity by doing so. Carnal mindedness is death. Spiritual mindedness is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God for it's not subject to the law of God nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And then he says this, but you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit if the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. So it's all about the Holy Spirit entering in. And when he enters in, you're fundamentally changed and you now have access to believe the gospel which was always there. It may have even been in front of you. It may have been preached to you day after day your whole life, but you couldn't believe it until that moment the Spirit entered into you. So Paul gives us a very definite order of saving events. The Spirit of God enters into the believer first. Now how do you know he came in? How do you know the Spirit came in? I'll tell you how I knew. I suddenly was desiring to hear more of the Word. And I was devouring it and believing it as it was preached. Suddenly I knew that my relationship to the Word had changed and everything I needed to know about God was now available to me. The Bible was always available to me. It was right there, the pages. But the Holy Spirit made the meaning of the words and the concepts available to me. And that's what's meant by being a spiritual being or being in the spirit. You're no longer subject to the dictates and limitations of your formerly carnal mind. That is the natural mind. Your mind has been indwelt by God. The Holy Spirit takes up residence in your mind. It's ready to believe God now. We're formerly... It had no power at all to do so. From 1 Corinthians, we read this. It's even clearer here. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. Now, God revealed himself in words, so words matter. Do you remember in grammar school... Those of you who went to grammar school, you raised your hand and you said, Mrs. Brown, can I go to the bathroom? And she said, yes, I'm quite sure that you can. Now sit down. (laughs) But I have to go to the bathroom. Can I go? Yes, you can. Now sit there and be quiet. I'm sorry, Mrs. Brown. May I go to the bathroom? Right? Anybody remember? I hate it, Mrs. Brown. Just kidding, there was no Mrs. Brown. I made her up. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolish to him, nor can he know them. It doesn't say, nor may he know them. He's not allowed to. He's allowed to know them, but he can't. He has no ability to know those things because they're spiritually discerned, and he's carnally minded. And he says this, though, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. In other words, God had to do an act to change you. Now you can believe, Mrs. Brown. You can believe. Now I want to tell you, it's important that we know that distinction because the gospel has content. 
all right? Do you ever hear somebody who talks about, whenever you ask them about their Christian life, they tell you about their experience? Well, you wouldn't believe what happened to me. I was driving along in the car, and this miraculous thing happened to me. And they tell some grand story. And you say, that's great, but what do you believe? And they really have less to say about what they believe than what happened to them. And we're supposed to say to them, well, you must be a Christian because that happened to you, even though you can't voice anything that Christians have to be able to say. This content in faith. You have to believe that Jesus is Lord and that Christ raised him from the dead, according to Paul here. And I can, and I can prove it to you that Experience does not save you. Because if you ask any person who is totally immersed in a cult, it's because he had an experience. But the content was all wrong. There was no godly truth in the experience. It was just, oh, there were angels about me. And the car was lifted. I hear all these stories. And I'm like, by the way, you don't have to believe anyone's story, even mine. You only have to believe what's written in the Word. Right? So it's not about your experience. Stop reveling in the day you think you were saved and tell me what you believe. It's belief that saves you and belief comes with content. God acts. Revelation comes. The gospel is heard by the newly regenerate person. He's already saved. And I'll show that to you. And then belief comes. Belief could not precede regeneration, nor could it precede revelation. So we may state with confidence that our doctrine is true. Regeneration, the new birth, precedes faith. If you keep that relationship straight, you'll understand what Jesus tried to explain to Nicodemus. And so Jesus said, unless one is born again, which is what? Regenerated. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Why? Because it's, it's a spiritual kingdom. Of course he can't see it. He's still in his carnal mind. Natural sight has no power to conceive spiritual reality. Now you'll say, well, I know a lot of people that are not saved and they're very spiritual, are they? A man who is merely born and not born again, he sees life through the lens of material existence. That's all he's equipped to see. It's a can and may thing, right? He can't see it. He's ill-equipped. And insofar as he imagines a spiritual world beyond this world, it is just that. It's his personal imagination. Friends, his testimony means nothing to me or to God apart from his confession of faith. You have to confess the truth about Christ to be saved. For the man who's born again, however, or as John says elsewhere, born of God in 1 John 5, 1, born again, born of God, there's different ways they say this. He not only sees this world, he not only sees beyond human imagination into another world, but he's able to conceive the objective reality of the kingdom of God. I keep driving home objective reality. We're not flighty spirits. We have flesh and bone just as Jesus had. Remember that. To bring it closer to home theologically, the born-again person sees the physical humanity of Christ, while at the same time recognizing in him the glorious divinity of Christ. The spirit sees the divinity. The man sees the man. Everyone that was there saw Christ, and not everyone was saved. The thief on the cross is useful here. He looked at a bludgeoned, bloody man beside him impaled on a stake of torture. And he saw the true light of Christ through the blood and the, and the lashes and the thorns and the nails. Imagine looking at that and seeing God. You don't figure that out. The Jews even missed it. 
God has to change you to look at that mass of blood and torture and say, that's God. Will you bring me into your kingdom? <laughs> he was changed because he began on the cross deriding Christ. And then he was changed. And he asked Christ to save him. And he was born again in that instant. And then he made a confession. Did you notice the thief on the cross made a confession? He said to the other thief, you and I deserve this, but this man does not. And he defended his Lord. But what about confession? Is the man saved apart from outward confession? If I were to answer in the natural, I'd say yes. The man is saved by faith alone, whether he confesses or not. However, there's a character of faith, and confession's part of that. So if it's real, you will confess. You follow? The nature of faith is never silent. It always breaks out into words of praise and thanksgiving. So there's content in faith. You have to believe certain actual truths, right? Facts of life. And there's a character of faith. It bursts out. So I would say that real belief bubbles up inside the believer. It expands. It's an inward pressure trying to get out. You see it... it it's a theological principle that genuine saving faith always pours forth like a stream of water dammed up that's suddenly released. That's why Jesus said, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. But he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive. Believing breaks forth out of his belly. It says in the New King James, out of his heart. Belly, exactly. The Old King James had it right. It's not cardia, it's kalia. Um, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. It's like that leper in Mark 1. Remember the leper in Mark 1 uh, who Jesus explicitly told not to tell anyone how you were healed. He said, don't say a word. It's right here in your notes. See that you say nothing to anyone, Jesus said, but go, to, but go your way. And then we read, however, he went out and began to claim, it, to claim it freely and to spread the matter. He couldn't hold it in. Now, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have. I would have said, I'm afraid if I say anything, I'll turn into a leper again. He told me not to do it. But he couldn't. It was the faith doing its own thing. And I call it the Jeremiah principle. Don't look it up in your theological lexicon because I made up the term. Uh, there's, a th there's a Jeremiah principle, there's an Ezekiel principle, and I'm going to labor over them both next week. So be here. The prophet was given, Jeremiah was given a directive to proclaim, as we all know, in the Babylonian era, the Babylonians were coming in. You know they threw him into a pit like they did with Joseph? They threw him into a pit. They hated hearing the word of God so much, they persecuted him as they did many of the prophets. And because of this, he made a decision. I've had it with this word of God. Every time I speak, they persecute me, they deride me, they throw me in a pit. And so we read from Jeremiah 20, then I said, I'll not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. It burst out on its own. He's trying to hold it back, and he can't. So if you ask me, am I called to preach? I'm like, I don't know. Did the word burst out of you? You don't have to try to make it. If it's in you, it's the Jeremiah principle. You will preach it. In this sense, confession is the outward proof of genuine faith. Not only to others, but to ourselves. Right? Right? You find yourself defending the word of God all of a sudden. You know you're saved. Now having said all that, 
Let's look at the actual meaning of the verse. If it is anything, it's a definition of what it is to be a true believer or a genuine Christian. And this is an important point because there are many people today out there who say they're Christians who for a number of reasons I have to disagree with them. They're really not Christians. And it's all bound up in the meaning of the word. So the first important word in the verse is the word confess. Confess means to say something. The Greek word is homo legeo. And homo means the same, and lego means to speak. So it means to speak the same thing, to say the same thing. That's what confession is. So when, you, when it comes to Jesus Christ, you have to say the same thing about him that God said about him. And God wrote it down. So if you divert in your understanding of Jesus, and say he's something other than what the gospel says he is, that's not a confession of faith. It's a confession of what you think, but it's not a confession of faith, and you can't be saved through believing falsehood. You can't just make it up. So there are implications to consider with regard to the word confess. True confession of faith is to say the same thing with regard to Christ that God says of Christ. To proclaim not just a version of Christ, but a gospel version. You ever notice people love to have Jesus on their side and they throw out some verse they heard, and uh, usually it's not even a scripture verse, they just think it is. And they say things like, it's in the Bible. I don't know where, but it's in there. And I've had people say this to me and I'd say, well, I know everything about the Bible, and it's not there, okay? There are so many curious interpretations of Christ out there, and they haven't changed. We talk, I, I could say, oh, they, it's so bad out there today. It's always been that way. Do you know the, the New Testament was written in reaction to heresy? It might never have been written if people didn't all get it wrong in the churches and the false teachers didn't come in and start telling them they had to do all these works and various things. And Paul had to come in and say, no, 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 no. I'm writing this down so even you could understand. So I would say that there are many versions of Christ in our day, but the same misinterpretations, the same misunderstandings, and the same willful confusions about his identity have existed in all ages and rear their ugly heads from time to time. Let's turn quick to a couple of verses. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 4, where Paul writes to the Corinthians, For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. You've got to be careful about receiving. You know, in the first century, let me just tell you a couple of things. In the first century, Jesus was a very common name. Did you know there were four people in the New Testament named Jesus? It was a very common name. Um, today, it's still a very common name among Hispanic peoples. I was in Home Depot not too long ago, and um, I saw a young man, obviously Hispanic man, he had his name tag on, and it said Jesus. And I knew it was Jesus. When I looked at him, I knew it was Jesus. I profiled him, I admit it. And I said, Jesus, and he said yes, so I knew I got it right. But no, it's a common name. Jesus is a, is a common name. My great-grandfather was named Jesus. Jesus Kasiri. Jesu, they called him. Um, there are other Jesuses. Now, that's not what he means. He doesn't mean other guys named Jesus. He means other profiles of the Son of God that people make up that aren't really the one that I taught you. A couple more pages over. Go to Galatians chapter 1. Very famously, Galatians chapter 1. Verse 6, Paul says, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. All right, a different gospel. 
which is not another, because there really isn't a different gospel, right? But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. So it's done willfully, friends. And then he goes on and he says, but even if we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. We don't switch gospels. They're counterfeits. And as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you've received, let him be accursed. All right? He's pronouncing a curse on people who pervert the truth of the gospel and lead men astray. No, the gospel has content, and believing that content is a saving power. At that time, as in all ages, philosophy tried to in infiltrate Christianity and to make of it something it was never intended to be. These are satanic counterfeits. There are spirits in the universe who delight in fooling us. Again, from, uh, from 2 Corinthians, we read, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves. Did you get that part? Transforming? A lot of transforming going on today. Transforming themselves into apostles of Christ, and no wonder. Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. That's why when someone says, oh, I, I don't confess anything. I just had this experience. This angel of light came over me. Really? Which one? Right? Put less emphasis on experience and more in content. Satan transforms himself into angels of light. It's no big thing if his ministers transform themselves. And so he says, it's no great thing if his ministers transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their work. Now I wonder as I read this if it's significant in our time that we're under siege by a society that allows a person to transform him or herself into whatever is in their heart to become. A lot of transforming going on around here. And we're prompted by calls for compassion. See, we're told, don't worry about objective truth and objective reality. What we feel about ourselves is what I want to put forth. And it insults me very much if you don't agree with my imagination. And so we're prompted by calls for compassion for a charitable spirit to a beleaguered minority to accept their pretense as a fact and not to trouble them with our opinions. We're not to trouble one another with statements of objective reality. Don't weary me with facts. We're to believe what we're told in order to preserve something that is said to be important. It's the tender consciences of our fellow citizens who are so deceived. You know, I got to tell you, um, I got a lot of compliments for my new clothes today. I have a new jacket on, right? Um, Karen and I went there the last couple weeks. You know, they put it on. They fit it to you. We have to go back the next week. It's all fixed. And I got to know the guy's name's Chris, and I love this guy. And I, I want I, you know, it's great to have a guy who knows. I haven't had a good haberdasher. Nobody uses that term anymore. I asked him, and he says, no, no one uses it. And, but uh, we started talking, and... Um, it came up that I was a minister. A guy came in and he, he was in a rush. He had his rented tux and he didn't have the time. He's going in a rush. I said, guy, don't worry. I'm a minister. I've done this a lot. They won't start without you. He was the best man. I said, they're not going to start without you. He said, really? I said, no, you, you, you're good. They'll, you'll be there. The bride will be late anyway, so don't worry about it. And he's, and he's like, oh, I feel so good after talking to you. I found out this week I went back and I said to him, was he okay? He goes, oh, yeah. They, they waited for him. Um, <laughs> But um, I got talking to Chris, my guy, and, and it turns out Chris um, uh, was a history major. And we started talking, well, what era of history? Did you study the Roman era? Do you know about ancient writings? Oh, yes. I said, have you read Gilgamesh, the most ancient of all preserved writings? Oh, we read Gilgamesh over and over. I'm sick of Gilgamesh. I said, really? How about the Bible? Right? Another ancient document. Oh, yeah, I know a lot about the Bible, he said. He goes, 
But you know, it's been worked over and translated and retranslated. So you don't even know you don't even know if it's the real thing anymore. And I'm like, what school did you go to? Bridgewater. <laughs> Joe's school. <laughs> I'm reprogramming them right now. You sit there, young man, and listen to your father. <laughs> Um, get, don't, hey, don't feel bad. I went to a Catholic college. Got the same thing. Yeah, we don't know. I said, do you, are you, do you realize there are 5,000 copies of the New Testament dated back to the first century? We know if there's something amiss in a translation. Well, what about if a monk in the 8th century changed it? I said, yeah, what about it? It didn't happen. And if it did, we throw that manuscript out because it doesn't comport with the other 30,000 manuscripts that exist from that time on. It has not been changed. It is reliable. And so naturally, I have this big preaching session with my haberdasher. Um, he was skeptical. I didn't change anything. But there are other weeks. Christianity if it is nothing else, is a religion based on physical, historical reality. It's not based on personal experience or personal testimony. And I have nothing against your personal experience. I've had one. I've just told you about one. But your personal experience is not the path to salvation. Your personal confession is your path to salvation. Jesus was born of a woman. Historical fact. You know who denied that fact? Did you ever hear of Albert Schweitzer? He's considered one of the great missionaries of all times, the World War I era. And Schweitzer was one of the great geniuses among men. Schweitzer was a medical doctor, a great um, symphonic composer, a missionary of the, of the gospel in World War I in, uh, in Europe, I believe. And he wrote a book that I had to study in college, and I talked about it on Thursday night, and it's called The Quest for the Historical Jesus. And Schweitzer concluded that Jesus not only is not the Son of God, but he never really even existed. Now, any historian worth his salt knows he existed as a man. We can all understand that someone says, yeah, but the fact that he's the Son of God, born of a virgin, I'm a little, I'm not secure on those facts. I can understand that. But to say he didn't exist, it's way beneath this man's intelligence. So intelligence doesn't get you saved, obviously. Jesus was a historical person. He was born of a woman who had no relations with a man. Historical fact. He was born of God, the Holy Spirit, and the Virgin Mary. He lived and walked and preached and taught and healed, and he was nailed to a cross for his trouble, and you don't have to be a Christian to believe that. We know it happened. But because he did not share our sin nature with us, death had no legal hold on him, so God rectified the situation by raising him from the dead. If that's your confession, and you believe it, as Paul says, in the heart, which I'm going to get to what that means, then you're a believer. So Jesus going to his death, being innocent, not deserving of it, it was like an innocent man that had been incarcerated, right? And he went to jail, and then they found exculpatory evidence and realized they shouldn't be holding him because he didn't commit the crime, and the judge came in and let him out. That's what happened to Jesus. According to man's court, they sent him to death and hell. But in God's economy, an innocent man can't die. And that innocence that he had is imputed to us by the Holy Spirit. We cannot die. Christians don't die. Our bodies die once, and then the judgment, it says. But the Christian is alive. It's like taking off your coat. So to confess is never to make things up. That's not what confession is. Confession is the act of confirming of your own accord that you hold to a particular set of beliefs in certain objective facts about the life and nature of Jesus Christ. Hence the great confessions of faith. You know, a lot of evangelicals deride confessions of faith. Those are just 
organized um, statements of what we believe. There's plenty of creeds in the scriptures, in the New Testament and the Old Testament, right? This, this is just an organized list of what we believe. So they're good things. In Paul's time, there were many attempts to confuse the reality of the person of Christ for man-made conceptions of his person. There was the so-called Colossian heresy. So Paul said this, Beware to the Colossians, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy, that's man's wisdom, and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. And then he goes on to describe in doctrinal detail the nature of the Christ that the believer must confess in order to be a believer. And so he says, for in him dwells all the fullness of Godhead bodily. In other words, Jesus is God. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. In other words, he's preaching the deity of Christ against human philosophy who claimed he was not that. There were so many others. You've heard of the Gnostic heresy. The Gnostics. It was a dualistic philosophy that taught that the material world was evil and the spiritual world was good and righteous. Therefore, Jesus had no real humanity. Because if he did, they were pretending to care about Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, but they made up their own. And they said he couldn't have been a real man because he would be inherently evil. Jesus was inherently good. He was therefore only spirit. Friends, let me tell you something. Your flesh is not evil in and of itself. It's you that makes it evil. Therefore, the Jesus that they taught had no true humanity. He was spiritual only, for if he was actually made in the flesh, he would be evil, they said. So they concocted their own version and thus preached another Jesus. Now, how did John... The apostle countered this. Listen what he wrote in 1 John. He knew he was writing to a church where there were Gnostics and Gnostic influence. And he said, that which was from the beginning, John always says that at the beginning, right? From the beginning, in the beginning. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled. You can't handle a spirit. Concerning the word of life, and he goes on, the life was manifested, which means made real, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with the Father and with his Son. And you might say, boy, he's so repetitive. Martin Lloyd-Jones says if a preacher isn't repetitive, he's not a good preacher. Peter said, I... Preach not so much to instruct you, but to remind you. John is saying here, repeated references of physical reality. He was seen, not in our mind's eye, with our physical eyes. He was heard. He was touched with our hands. He was real and physical and manifested. He had humanity. He was not some ghostly apparition. That's the Christ we confess. You think you could nail a, a spirit to a cross? They don't even realize, you, you, you take one piece of the doctrinal pie out, the whole thing crumbles. It can't work anymore. So there's content in our gospel. It's not a loose collection of hopes and dreams and feelings. And those realities are the things we confess. And so what is it that we specifically confess? We confess that he is Lord. Now the Hebrew designation of Lord was the actual name of God. It was the name he gave to Moses to know him by. Remember he said, I am that I am. That's my name. All right? Well, the Jews, friends, superstitiously feared to use that name. So they obscured it. It was reduced to the so-called tetragrammaton, which is four letters, right? J-H-W-H, transliterated in English, right? It would have been pronounced either Jehovah or Yahweh or Yahweh, right, or something similar. It was not pronounced for so many centuries that the true pronunciation of it is lost to us. It seems to me that the commentators believe Yahweh is correct. 
I have a friend, Henry Morse, he wrote a book about Jesus called My Name is Not God. Have you ever read his book, My Name is Not God? He's a Jewish Christian, and he's trying to say God actually has a name, and it's Yahweh. Now, the Hebrew writers of the Septuagint version, that's the version in Greek that existed in Jesus' day, right? They substituted the Greek word kurios for the tetragrammaton, and they translated it Lord. So when we read Lord, the original had his actual name. The word itself means a person of power and authority, a master or owner. However, the New Testament writers co-opted the word to refer always either to Jesus or to God or to both. So when you believe in the name, you believe in the person of God. Thomas famously declared when Jesus displayed his wounds to him, he said, my Lord and my God, right? Peter, in his first sermon after re the resurrection, said of the risen Christ, God has made him Lord. Psalm 34, 8 says, O taste and see that Jehovah is good. And Peter uses this declaration of Jesus in 1 Peter 2, 3. James uses kurios for God and for Jesus. He says in chapter 1 of the double-minded man, let not that man suppose he'll receive anything from the kurios, the Lord. And he uses the same word kurios here as he did in introducing the epistle when he said, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord, kurios, Jesus Christ. From the lexicon we read, Paul ordinarily uses kurios of the Lord Jesus, but also on occasion of God. The divinity of Christ is is bound up in the name because the word means something. All that is to say that to divest the Lord Jesus Christ from his full title as Jehovah, God, ruler, and creator of the universe, to divest him of that is to say something other than what the gospel says of him. To confess that he is Lord, curios to the Jews, was to confess his deity. That's what offended them about Jesus. He claimed to be, I am, and he actually said the name. So we come to the third operative word in the text. It's the word translated heart, cardia. The lexicon tells us that this, the heart, is the chief organ of physical life. And then it says, by an easy transition, the word came to stand for man's entire mental and moral activity, both the rational and the emotional elements. In other words, the heart is figuratively for the hidden springs of the personal life. When you say you believe in the heart, you believe in the very essence of your being. The heart is the seat of moral life. It's the seat of your emotions. It's, the, it's where grief comes from. It's the home of your desires and perceptions and understandings. It's here the reasoning powers, the imagination, the conscience of man reside. And so we read this in verse 10. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, the inner being of man. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So in the very essence of our being, we believe that Jesus is Lord God of all that is, and with the mouth we say of him what was said anciently of him. We believe in the whole Christ, the one who became incarnate through the virgin, the one who was crucified upon the cross, the one who was bur buried in the tomb, and the same one whom death could not hold. He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. O oh, Father, in Jesus' name, give us great revelation of the person of Christ and renew our confession of faith in us now even as we pray in Jesus name. Amen.